What's up guys, Steve Nader 1, 2, and 2, and it's List Day. Ah uh, yes, List Day, and today we're looking at the top 10 cards that changed the way we play yu gi -Mans. Over the history of this game, we've had several cards that released that changed the way Yu-Gi-Oh! was physically played. Whether it was how you put cards on the board, how you built your deck, the strategies you chose to use, or whatnot. These 10 pull cards still have a lasting effect in the game, and we thought this would be a very interesting topic, and uh, what better format to discuss it in, then a list, because that is what I do. This one was specifically Ryan's idea, so uh, good on him. I think this is actually a pretty compelling list, and we actually put it together in chronological order, so it could also act as the Yu-Gi-Oh! Timeline of Important Cards. So without further ado, let's do it! Number 10. Coming out in December 20. 11, Gores, the Emissary of Darkness. This level seven dark fiend monster, 2700 attack, 2500 defense, has the following effect. When you take damage from a card in your opponent's possession, you can special summon this card. Its effect changes depending on how that damage was dealt, which is actually kind of an interesting effect. I, I wish we got more things like this that were dependent on specific game mechanics happening. I think this is kind of interesting. If it was battle damage, you can special summon an Emissary of Darkness token that stats equal that of the damage you took. So if you wait for a direct attack, you can get big number on your side of the board next to the gores itself. Uh, and if it was effect damage, you can inflict damage to your opponent equal that. No, no one ever, that never happens. You care about the first one. So why was this card important for game? Well, even till this day, you'll still have some of us Yuki boomers attacking with our weakest monster first when we attack directly so that if you do happen to have a gores, you can special summon it with a token and that token will be equal to the attack power of our weakest guy. So the next guy up the food chain can just take out the token. Even on our streams, we still we still make jokes about playing around gores. Just like some other instances on this list, there is no reason to not play around it because you can physically just avoid this card by attacking with your weakest and progressing up just in case your opponent is some weirdo old boogie boomer playing gores because you don't actually know especially in a format like mastery duels where even in ranked you still find some people in gold playing kitchen sink turbo so you know what you might as well just play around it Number nine, coming in at May 2013, the Dragon Rulers. In this case, we're going to be using Blaster because I like Blaster. There is no other, no other reason. You'd think I'd like Title, right? Because I'm like Water Deck Boy, but no, I like Blaster for some reason. I don't know why. Every one of the Dragon Rulers is some sort of elemental dragon level seven of a various attribute that has the following effect. You can special summon it from your hand or graveyard, big important, by banishing two monsters from your hand or graveyard, also big important, that are either of the attribute of that said dragon ruler, in this case it would be fire, or a dragon monster, to summon this thing. And if this is the thing that is banished, like by per se one of the other dragon rulers, you can search a monster of its attribute, in this case again, Fire. That monster, however, must be a dragon. And then they all have some uh, individual discard ability that you discard them and one of their attributes. This marked a very important part in Yugi Man's kind of early to mid Ixi era, where decks went from good to really, really good wombo combo. Pretty, 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 pretty good. We had some wombo combo synchro decks before, but the fact that dragon rulers can kind of just keep going even further beyond. And the fact that every one of their boss monsters, the dragon rulers themselves are completely recursive. They trip the other one's effect. They search more resources. The deck is really hard to stop unless you are specifically Jaugen the spiritualist. It marks just a very specific point in Yu-Gi-Oh where deck building kind of really where it started to really upshift in, in, in speed and power. So much so that, you know, in order to deal with this deck, we, we have like half of the dragon rulers on the ban list. And like for a very long time, we also had banned all the cards that kind of happened to work with them, like all the level seven and or dragon support cards. So like these things really, really did have a huge impact on the game. Coming at you at February 2015, Jin, release your rituals. Ah, what made Necroz really good? 
Well, it was one of two things. One, the deck is extremely consistent because the searchers have searchers. You need that level of consistency in a ritual deck because rituals are inherently terrible. And also, Jin really serve rituals. If a monster is ritual summoned using this thing as material, in which this thing can also be in the graveyard to be said material, and it's a level three fiend, so you can get that to the graveyard pretty easily in a lot of cheesy fashions. Your opponent can't special summon as long as you control the ritual summon monster that uses this thing as material. Okay, so along the way, your opponent's wombo combo just drops a monster that says you cannot special summon, as well as putting up a few interactions. That's extremely powerful in a deck that already had a lot of consistency and a pretty decent power ceiling, leading to a practically tier zero format there in Secret Forces Duelist Alliance era. So much so, uh, people started doing crazy things like main decking Bull Blader and Book of Eclipse in order to deal with it, or simply just by a gentleman's agreeing deciding to decide it out. That's a joke for the Yugi Boomers in the crowd. <laughs> but this card was so prolific in that format in a deck that was so, so good that it did physically cause people to build around a specific card, and that is the name of the game here in this list. Granted, this doesn't have the lasting repercussions that something like Gore's had because the card's no longer usable, so you don't have to worry about it no more. But with things like Mystic Mine in the modern format, there is still this pervasive theme of there's just one card in the format that dumps on you so hard that you got to put an out in your deck for it. That is so fun. That is very Yu-Gi-Oh of it. All right, number seven, the Ghost Girls. I believe it was Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit premiering in May of 2015, I believe was the first one. And over the course of the next couple of years, we kept getting these mostly level three zombie hand trap girls. There were also tuners, which sometimes matters, especially for a card later in the list. Hand traps in general have existed in Yugi Mans for a very long time. Karibo being, I think, one of the first ones. In that it is a monster card that has an effect that can be used during your opponent's turn to do some kind of effect that may possibly stop them from doing something. But up until we got the Ghost Girls, hand traps were pretty hit or miss. We had things like, I'm pretty sure Droll existed before this, Valor existed before this, um, but those were very specifically good in specific formats, and at that point the game wasn't so incredibly ridiculous that you couldn't also accomplish the same thing with just a regular track card like I don't know, Solemn Brigade or something like that. These very powerful Ghost Girl hand traps gave us an option to stick in our decks in order to mitigate what turn one player can do. And now pretty much they're a staple in every deck. It, every deck at least plays three hand traps. Not only have hand traps become so prolific in the game that you can't leave home without them, uh, they also kind of gatekeep the format in a fashion. Ash Blossom Enjoy Spring says you can't search shit. So meaning if your deck's strategy can't play through one Ash Blossom, it just absolutely needs to get its first search off to do anything, your deck is pee pee bad and you should stop playing it. <laughs> that is the rule for Yugi Mans now. The litmus test for a, whether a deck is okay or not is can it play through an Ash Blossom interruption. But not only have these hand traps warped how we build our decks physically and play the game, it also lets us suss out who is the weirdo at the tournament because they chose to play Ash Blossom Enjoys Feet. <laughs> A litmus test for uh, your opponent's moral compass, I guess. <laughs> hey man, I'm gonna get a bunch of angry Quentin Tarantino fans in my comments. <laughs> Number six, coming out in February 2017, That Grass Looks Greener. All right, this is a fun entry on the list because not only does this warp the way the game is played, it warps deck building like physically. Not just like I need to put hand traps in in order to even get into the boys club here. No, it's literally, literally. The structure of my deck has been changed by this card. I think that is actually kind of fascinating. That Grass Looks Greener is a spell card that allows you to mill cards off the top of your deck to the graveyard to, so that your deck now equals the number of cards in your opponent's deck. Which sounds like, you know, you might get two or three. Kind of cute. Unless you play 60 cards and your opponent's playing a 40 card deck and after you both draw your hands, you're milling roughly 20 cards. That's some, um, that's a lot of mills. Milling 20 cards off the top of your deck to the graveyard is pretty good in literally, literally every strategy in the game. Every single viable strategy in Yu-Gi-Oh! probably has at least one card 
they would love to start the duel just magically in their graveyard. Not only were people moving away from a 40 card deck to a 60 card deck to get the most value out of grass, people were moving to a 60 card deck even if they weren't playing grass just to counter the grass. That's a lot of grass, man. Ooh. Yeah, tell me about it, dude. I just think it's very neat that this card physically changed the actual card count in a standard deck of Yu-Gi-Oh. Normally a player wants to play 40 cards in order to increase the odds of drawing any one card in their deck. Now people are just packing their decks full of crap so you don't mill 20 cards. That's a weird, weird thing to be in. Again, they banned it because uh, I guess they, they, they don't like when cards force people to build decks in certain ways. Number five is board placement cards. Like physically caring where you put things on the board physically. Before this point, uh, no one really cared. There was cards that dealt with columns, but no one played them. So there was a lot more free form card placement before this point. But when we got things like Mech Knights and then like Link Monsters after this and things like that, it really, really mattered where cards go because things actually say, put this somewhere where something else exists. With things like Mech Knights and uh, what one we pick? Indigo Eclipse here. If there's two cards in the same column, it can just play itself to the board. Meaning that if you are going first against a Mech Knight strategy, you now need to try to stagger all of your cards in an attempt to not give them a free place to special summon their monster. You gotta try to make it as hard on them as possible. You are literally, literally. playing around mech knights when you're like staggering your cards. On the whole, I just think it's kind of fascinating there was such a stark difference between the way cards were played to the board before and after cards like this came out. Um, it's just, it's just neat. I just think they're neat. Number four, Infinite Impermanence, May 2018. Infinite Impermanence is a, kind of a double whammy here because it's kind of in the same vein as some previous entries. Like the Ghost Girls, it's a hand trap, but in this case, it's literally a trap card. Literally. That's kind of fun. That if you don't control anything, you can just slap this shit down and negate the effect of one of your opponent's monsters you target on the field. Giving the player going second, a very useful tool to use against some very key monster effects your opponent is using in their big wombo combo. But also, if you do control cards or you are going first, unlike other hand traps this card has a secondary function if you do control monsters or you just went first and you now it's going to be dead if you do literally anything literally. you can put it on the field like a regular trap and use it after resolution of this card if it was set on the field before it was activated all spells and traps in the column in which this thing was used in are negated until the end of the turn the cards that this thing negate don't need to be in the column upon resolution just things that are played there meaning if your opponent isn't careful and they activate a spell card in the impermanence column it will just be inherently negated it doesn't, no effect happens, it just fizzles for no reason. So not only is it a hand trap like the Ghost Girls, but it's also acting now like the Mech Knights, where you're physically playing around the impermanence column so you don't accidentally let your opponent negate your Monster Reborn for free. Playing an impermanence in the middle column is a great way to, you know, kind of catch an opponent off guard, or playing your impermanence into a column your opponent already has a back row, kind of trying to use it as a pseudo MST along with negating a monster effect. This card is very good and allows you to get some extremely good value out of it depending on how you use it in your technical play. So this thing's kind of a nice twofer. There's a lot you can do with this card and it changes the way we play. Number three, coming out in August 2019, we got Nibiru, the primal being. Finally! Dwayne the Rock Johnson here is a monster that has the following effect. During the main phase, if your opponent summons five or more monsters, quick effect, you contribute as many face-up monsters as possible to summon this thing to your side of the field, and then you give your opponent a token whose stats equal the stats of all the monsters tributed. If you played in defense mode and you had tributed a bunch of Link monsters because those Link monsters have no defense power whatsoever, you're giving your opponent a monster token with like a million attack power and zero defense so you can then just beat over it and not have to worry about your opponent turning the tables with big number. So why is this good? Well, again, it is a hand trap, so uh, that immediately is a very powerful card and changes what your opponent is doing during their wombo combo in an attempt to play around a card that is now a threat as soon as the duel starts. But more importantly, Summoning five or more monsters is really not hard to do when you are some sort of synchro or link spam deck. It doesn't take
make very many of your plays before you get that magical number five. And it's not five summons, it's five monsters. So even if you pendulum summon a bunch of shit, it doesn't get around this. It's just, did you put five guys on board or not? So a lot like Max C, making your opponent weigh their options, a possible Nibiru threat means your opponent, if they go a little bit too far with their combo, they might just lose everything to a giant tribute. However, it is still a monster effect to do this. So in order to combat this, we now have wombo combos being only viable if on like the fifth summon or less, they can put a monster negate on board before they continue with the rest of the wombo combo. Something like Herald of Arc Light or some other business, Appaloosa, are now a required part of your play line if you don't want to get everything sent to the graveyard. Because even though that token is very big, getting hit in the middle of your wombo combo uh, after your fifth summon means you might be out of gas at this point if everything gets sent, so it's very imperative that you can negate the Nibiru effect. And because we have Max C and Master Duels, Nibiru is actually probably even better in that format because uh, if your opponent decides that, you know what, screw it, I will take the Maxi challenge, they might just give you the Nibiru and then um, get very severely punished. I think Nibiru is kind of interesting because unlike Gores, which, you know, determines how we attack monsters or Grass, which is how many cards we put in our deck, this one is uh, how we build our combo lines. They're forever changed because of a threat of Great. Big. Rock. 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 All right. We did it, boys. We put something on this list I can't explain because I never play this. <laughs> Number two is Crystron, Helka Fibrax, and Mecha Phantom Beast, Aurora Dawn. These two guys go hand in hand, allowing you to wombo combo. Helka Fibrax is a really good link too. As long as you have a tuner and a non-tuner on your board, you can make this thing. Then it summons a tuner from your deck. And there is plenty of tuners that have recursive grave effects. So being able to uh, use your dead ash blossom to turn it into, I don't know, O-Lion or something, means you can just get a really nice solid plus one off your card advantage. You can go into Mecha Phantom Beast Aurora Ton, which is a big old Link 3 monster, doesn't really care what it's made of, as long as there are machines, which the Helka Fibrax is, and so is the O-Lion that you're probably grabbing with it, or whatever is legal in the current format. And if this thing is Link Summon, you can summon a bunch of tokens. Uh, three. Wow. So now you can just make even more things. Both these things being particularly generic means that most decks can put in one or two cards to accommodate this little wombo combo, thus changing the way our extra decks are built. Instead of having interesting divergent strategies, it's all just, does this deck make Halkadon? Back of the booster pack be damned. Now, what do you make with it? I don't know. I don't play wombo combo. I don't, I don't friggin' know. At that point though, you got four guys on board. You can literally make whatever the hell you want. And we have an honorable mention. That honorable mention is Cyber Dragon. This thing's basically number 11. It had to be because it is the most earliest chronologically. In August 2005, we had the end of what people considered the GOAT format. GOAT format is probably the last bastion of classic Yu-Gi-Oh. You played a bunch of power spells, a bunch of weird one-off monsters in your GOAT strategy using like the scapegoats to just chump block shit or go into Thousand Eyes Restrict with your Metamorphosis. Everyone was kind of playing the same version of this mishmash GOAT deck instead of playing like dedicated archetypal strategies. And then when we got Cyber, Cyber Dragon. Everything changed. Cyber Dragon is a level five that you can just kind of slap down if your opponent's got any monster on board. And not only that, it does also facilitate various contact fusions. So it just really accelerated the game past set morphing jar being a, a particularly viable strategy. Thus kind of ending classic Yu-Gi-Oh. And Cyber Dragon is also just kind of a herald of the things that will come. It's just a monster that can put itself on board. Now everything does that. So this is a, a pretty ahead of its time. It's a light machine. A lot going for Cyber Dragon still. Ew! This one, number one's Mystic Mind. <laughs> All right, we're gonna talk about Mystic Mind. Hot take. Mystic Mind is totally healthy. I'm kidding. Inherently! Okay, so Mystic Mind's a lot like the Jin releaser of rituals that we talked about above. It is a card that is extremely oppressive in a format. It is a one card floodgate that just stops up your opponent from doing a thing. In this case, a couple of things. And forces you to deck build around it. What does Mystic Mind do for the three people in existence who do not know? First of all, this thing is a field spell card which is actually really important to this part of the discussion. But its effect says if your opponent controls more monsters than you do, your opponent cannot activate monster effects or declare attacks. That's two floodgate abilities. Wow. It does flip back on you if you control more monsters than your opponent, um, but if you're playing a Mystic Mind deck, 
I don't know, like Sky Strikers or something. That's never going to happen. You have like one guy on board max at like any time. And during the end phase, if both players control the same number of monsters, this thing blows up. So why does this change Yugi Mans? The card itself doesn't do anything particularly spectacular. It is a skill drain and also constant threatening roar. It's just a generic cheesy stall card. However, the fact that it is a field spell is a tad problematic. Every floodgate in this game is obnoxious, but most of them have at least the common decency of being a continuous trap card, which means they are at least a little bit difficult. It is just as easy to draw the MST to blow it up as it is to draw the Imperial Order to play. There's a big meme going around the communities where it's just draw the out, you know, just draw your spell trap destruction. That is a bit unreasonable to ask a player to do because most of the time MST and things are not searchable. And that is balanced out by the fact that things like skill drain are also on the whole, not searchable, so it, it's you're kind of on an even playing field. But when you get things like this, which is a field spell, which has multiple cards that can get to it, you run into this problem where even if you do draw it out, your opponent probably just gets another one. That's pretty big annoying. So now we're just like Bull Blader and things, we're now forced to main deck spell trap removal, which I don't think is the end of the world, but it, it does morph the way we are building decks. And this one's kind of fun because it is a, it is a current card. This is a current issue requiring players to build around it. Also, we're in a monster heavy format. Uh, we have been for probably 15 years. Uh, most decks live or die by their monster effects. So uh, this is a very, very specifically powerful floodgate effect as well. All right, guys, that was the list. I'm gonna end it here before my camera overheats and uh, join us next time. I think we're gonna be doing the worst animations in Master Duels. I think that's the next list. So anyway, guys, remember, if you don't troll the meta, who will? I'll see you guys next time.